said the prayer is not really a prayer, it's just a technology. In other words, if you could just, uh, if you could just see things in terms of energy, and if you could see lower energy as hatred, as anger, as bitterness, as fear, as worry, as anxiety, and you could see higher energy as love and kindness and serving and peace and joy and so on, if you could just see, and all he's saying is that when you bring, like in a dark room, when you're in a dark room um, uh, and, and you want to bring light to the room, you don't have to warn the darkness or anything, you just bring higher energy, you bring light to the presence of darkness, and not only do you get rid of the darkness, but you convert darkness into light. You literally become a conversion. So, so high energy in the face of low energy, all throughout you know, physics and quantum physics and so on, higher energy in the face of lower energy brings higher energy up. Lower energy in the face of higher energy can never bring higher energy down. So they said of the great spiritual masters like of Jesus that when he would go into a village, you know, just his presence in the village would elevate the consciousness of everybody in the village. When, uh, when a Mother Teresa walked into the room, everybody felt uh, her presence because she was operating at and living at a much, much higher, more, more peaceful, more beautiful, more God-realized, if you were, a Tao-centered uh, existence or Tao-centered life. And when people are like that, when you meet a person who's operating at these really high energy places because they are associated with or aligned with, I should say, with, with God consciousness, um, you feel different when you're in the room with them than you do with somebody uh, who's got very low energy, who's very angry, who's full of revenge, who can't have forgiveness and so on. There, You become a person who's, uh, uh, who, who <coughs> impacts uh, you know, people in a, in, a, in a negative kind of way. So um, I had, before I went to Assisi, I had taken, uh, I, I, I had a problem with this right knee, and I had um, been to several doctors, several orthopedic people, and my wife kept telling me having a look at it because I had to wear a brace everywhere I went, and they did MRIs on it, and they told me I would have to have this knee replaced, ultimately, that it was getting to be bone on bone, and years and years and years of running, you know, almost 30 years of running, and tennis playing, and t tournaments, and so on, had just taken its toll, and that I would have a knee replacement. But I just did not like the idea of them putting me under and then snapping my leg in half and putting something there in the middle and uh, and I didn't think too much more about it but um, I wasn't I wasn't keen on that so I went to went to Assisi and I was writing over there and lecturing and we got we went to a place in San Damiano which is about 18 kilometers from Assisi and it's a place where um, Sister Claire Mary Claire who was the first woman to be uh, a part of the Franciscans. She was a young woman who was enamored of all the ideas of St. Francis and wanted to go out and teach the world about peace and about love and about kindness and all of those kind of things. So um, we were going to visit the place where she, uh, where she died, which was on the third floor of this castle. So there was, uh, we started to walk up this castle, and it's an old castle. It was built like in the seventh century. So it's old cement, uh, you know, concrete, you know, and it had a circular stair. There were no elevators or anything like that. And it had a circular staircase that would wind its way up so you could get up to the third level. And that's the, that was the bedroom where uh, St. Clair, um, this beautiful young soul, uh, uh, did all of her praying and work and so on. And on that trip with me was a young man. His name was John. And he, um, he had uh, cerebral palsy. And he wore, two, he wore a brace on both of his legs. He was about six foot two, and the braces each weighed 25 pounds, one on the right leg, one on the left leg. And we started to walk up the stairs to go up there, and he could l take his leg, and he could lift it out like this, and then he could take the other leg, and he could lift it up like this, and he'd go up the stairs one at a time. But he had to be able to reach his leg way out to do this. Well, as we were going up the staircase, it narrowed and got narrower and narrower and narrower to a point where... All you could fit in there was your body as you were going up. And he couldn't move his leg to the right. He couldn't move his leg to the left. He couldn't go back down the stairs. Obviously, if you try to imagine what it would be like to have braces and go downstairs, it doesn't work that way, you know. And he said to me, he said, uh, he said, Wayne, he said, I can't go any further. I can't move my legs and I can't go back down. What are we going to do? And without thinking, without anything, I just said to him, John, just strap your arms around my, my neck and I will carry, you know, and I'll carry you up the rest of these stairs. 
It was three flights of stairs. We had only gone, oh, maybe a flight and a half or so. So we started going, and after about seven or eight steps with him on my back, and I was 60 years old at the time, um, my leg started to collapse, this right knee. And I hadn't put any weight on that at all. I had never gone anywhere without a brace if I was running or playing tennis or anything. I just didn't wear my brace that day. And all of a sudden, my leg just started to collapse with him on top of me. And I just had a whole vision of all of us. There was a, maybe a hundred people all in line to get up to this place and all of us sort of collapsing on top of each other and the headlines in the SCC Daily News, you know. America's spiritual teacher found at the bottom of this heap of people, you know, and so on. So, um, as, and then I realized as I was up that I didn't have my brace on. And I thought, oh my God, what is going to happen? And in that split second, I had a vision of St. Francis what he looked like, this little man who uh, I, had, I had really studied his life in depth, and I was there in Assisi to do more studying and to walk in the same fields where he had walked and done his healing and so on. It was a very exciting time for me. I've been there many times. And um, in that second, when I was just about to collapse, he just put his hands up like this and said something, and I can't, I still to this day cannot remember what words it was, but, but you can walk, or you can stand, or it, it's okay, you're fine. And I stood up, and in that moment, I smelled roses again. I had this, like, this, like right in this staircase, it was just this floral essence, and um, as I was about to go down, instead of going down, I stood back up. And my leg was like totally, it was, it was working again. And I had a rush of energy like I've never experienced ever in my life before. And it was like, I went like this, and like this. And all of a sudden, I didn't walk anymore. I started running up this staircase with this 240 or so pound man with the braces on, on my back. And I ran up to the, all the way, all the way up, three flights to the top energized, almost like I was flying. I got up to the top, my wife was standing there, and all the other people said, what happened to you? What, what, and it, you're, you're running with John on your back. How could you possibly be doing that? Everybody's out of breath and all of that. I said, something very bizarre happened down there. And I went over to the balcony, and I just put my hands together, and I just was giving thanks. And that picture was on the cover of uh, There's a Spiritual Solution to Every Problem. Somebody snapped that picture. I didn't even realize there was a photographer. And all I was doing was just giving thanks, okay? So that's part one of the story. And that, that happened in, 19, in 2000. So for six years or seven years, I thought that the reason that that happened... Now, my leg was totally healed. I have never worn a brace since. Every once in a while I get a little stiffness in it, but I can do yoga on it, I can run on it, I can swim on it, I can dance on it. I've never been back to have any surgery. There's no, it was like, it was a total, complete healing of, of a very, very serious injury that I had had in that moment. And I, th I thought to myself, um, and I started playing tennis again without braces. I started running, you know, marathon, things like that. All of this on this knee that was supposed to be gone bone on bone. So for the six or seven years, I thought, how could this happen? You know, and, and why did it happen to me? And my conclusion was that it happened to me because I'm special. <laughs> and that I, it, was my, it, it was my ego. I mean, it was like I was over there. I was lecturing on St. Francis. I was communicating a, a, a his ideas. I was writing a book about it. It was like natural that you know, this famous American guy is over there and St. Francis is going to appear to me because I'm so special, you know, so. And I really thought that for up until just a short time ago when I started working on, on my book on the, on the Tao Te Ching, Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life. And it began to hit me. There's another collection of writings of, of, of Lao Tzu, and it's called the uh, Hua Hu Ching, which means it's the unknown teachings of Lao Tzu. And this is one of the things that he says in verse 59 and 60. He says, uh, If you wish to become a divine, immortal angel, then restore the angelic qualities of your being through virtue and service. There is only, this is the only way to gain the attention of the immortals 
who teach the methods of energy enhancement and integration that are necessary to reach the divine realm. The divine realm is the realm of meaning. When you are totally on purpose in your life and you're getting the guidance of the divine realm. These angelic teachers cannot be sought out, Lao Tzu says. You can't find them. You can't ask for them. It is they who will seek out the student. When you succeed, when you succeed in connecting your energy with the divine realm, that is, live in a God consciousness way as God lives, through high awareness and the practice of undiscriminating virtue, the transmission of the ultimate subtle truths will follow. And then he says in verse 60, the mystical techniques for achieving immortality are revealed only to those who have dissolved all ties to the gross worldly realm of duality, conflict, and dogma. As long as your shallow worldly ambitions exist, the door will not open. As long as your shallow worldly ambitions exists, the door will not open. So then I go back to the story that I'm telling you about a CC and this magical miracle thing that I thought happened to me because I'm just a chosen one. You know, I'm the chosen guy with the big ego, you know, and like, of course St. Francis is going to pick me. Who else would he pick? All right. And, and so on. And I really thought that for the last five, I mean, just not like I was, I, I thought you know, I'm deserving of something special, but I just associated, using the intellect, I just associated all of the things that I was doing with, of course, this is a natural unfolding. And I'm obviously above all of these other people who don't, you know, so, so all of that was going on in my head. All right. And, um, and then, it, then it hit me when I read this and when I wrote Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life, that the way that you make the transition to open the door to the divine realm, which is the realm of purpose, it's the realm of meaning, it's the realm of, of living your dharma, fulfilling your destiny, what you signed up for, is by living the undiscriminating virtue that he's talking about. So what are the virtues? And what was I doing in that moment? Now, in the moment that John said, what are we going to do, I didn't think of myself at all. It never occurred to me. Nothing else occurred to me other than whatever it is that's going on in you, forget it, just help this guy out. You know, you've got to help him out, and you're, you're, the, you're right next to him. You're the only one that can and I forgot totally about myself. I let go of all of what might be, what might be involved with me, that I might, I might hurt my leg, that, uh, you know, that, that's a long way to carry somebody who weighs more than I do, that it's, you know, I didn't do any of that. I just immersed myself in total service to this person, which is what God realization is all about. I mean, the poet Hafiz has this wonderful line. He said, um, even after all this time, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. He said, just think what a love like that can do. It lights up the whole world. So it's like, it's not so, so I was in the moment that I lived the virtues, was really 100% living the virtue. I understood what is meant when, uh, you know, uh, this idea that uh, the laws of the material world do not apply in the presence of the God realized. The laws of the material world don't apply in the presence of God, in the presence of God realization, okay? 